You know, it's Monday, OG, and you know what that means. Yes, it's another Monday. No. It's a manic Monday. I wish it was Sunday, because that's my fun day. <laughs> my, I don't have to run day? Okay, that's enough. I think everybody gets the joke. Let's move along. Is Oh, is that a joke? I thought we were making that up as we went. I, I don't even know what he's referring to. But what I'm referring to is the fact that we had a safe weekend again this weekend because of the men and women of our military keeping us safe. So here's two our military members on behalf of the men and women making this podcast here in mom's basement and the men and women of Navy federal credit union. Big shout out. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Let's go stack some Benjamins together. Shall we? He got me invested in some kind of fruit company. And so then I got a call from him saying, we don't have to worry about money no more. And I said, that's good. One less thing. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today is Change a Pet's Life Day. Know how you can change a pet's life? Just pay attention to them. It's not that difficult. And it's hard to pay attention to anything when your house is full of junk. So today, we're talking trash with the author behind the book, Don't Be Trashy, Tara McKenna. Plus, in our headline segment, bad news for that Peloton bike in the corner. What's it mean for you and your investments? And we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to VJ, who asks a great tax planning question. And now, two guys who are ready to trash some bad financial planning. It's Joe and O J J J J G. We got the torches out. We're ready to go, OG. Time to trash some bad financial planning. Hey, everybody, welcome to your Monday. It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. You made it. You're here. You're through the weekend. You're ready to successfully navigate the waters of this week, and uh, we're going to kick it off, OG, with some fun. The end of January already. It is about time. I don't know about that, but... What's your problem with January? Da- no, I'm just hey, saying it's back off like... on January. What did January ever do to you? Exactly. It's, it's, it's burning a beautiful through. month. It's burning through. No, I'm just saying it's hard to, hard to believe. No, I wasn't questioning you. It was Joe who was so aggressively spewing hate on January. Went after Doug's friend January. Yeah. Yes. No. It's Doug's 12th favorite month of the year. Darkest month of the year. And uh, we're almost through it. Heading into February soon. I don't know if you guys know your calendaring. (laughs) (laughs) Hold on. What other ones were we going to go into, Joe? If if only there was a tool that could show us (laughs) which months are coming next. Time to time, though. So you got to be... You got to be on your A game to know what month comes next. I mean, when, when was the last time they wow. fixed this around? <laughs> or at least 50, over. 50 AD. Yeah. They, uh, they, they, I mean, it's only been 2,000 years, give or no. take. No, no, no. We got to go to the, come on, are we going to go here? Because the whole Gregorian calendar thing, that was like the year 800, I think. No, somebody's, at least one listener is going to. This sounds like a trivia question that we should have. Oh, great one. Yeah, Too because they, they basically got rid of 10 days and all the people in Europe thought they were going to die 10 days sooner when they moved to the Gregorian calendar. Kind of sort of true, but <laughs> it's just math, Doug. I know. I know. If you take 10 days off of the calendar, now yeah. multiply that by 70 years, that's 700 million days early. You're basically already dead. That is super early. We got a great show today. People who are wondering if we're going to actually have a show today. We are. We got uh, Tara McKenna. Coming down to the basement, talking about cleaning up the trash. So that, we got that coming up. Big headline today, huge news last week out of one of America's favorite companies that got us through the uh, first couple of years of COVID. And we're going to dive into that. But first. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number. Your family. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number. Your family. Welcome to a new segment we call The Money Minute with Rachel. I'm Rachel, a certified money coach. 
My mama said I'd never get this job because that time they repoed my car. But who said you have to be good with money to be a coach? Not me, you know what I'm saying. Okay, so let's get down to those little brass tacks. Do you want more money in your life? Do you? Today, I'd like to help you concentrate on saving more money. Ready? I knew you could. Just like my daddy told my brother when he shot out the TV, if your aim is straight, you'll hit it every time. Look at you. You're now a money concentrating pro. And yes, before you ask, I am certified. I got it from the Southwest Bahama State University and Technical Institute Internet Degree Program. See you next time. All right, Tara McKenna waiting upstairs, so let's get to this headline, shall we? Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from just about everywhere. Oh, gee. Uh, this one, though, CNBC, Laura and Thomas wrote this. Man, she's been all over the story. I've read like six different stories by Lauren. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but at least three on this. Uh, as things move quickly last week, Peloton to halt production of its bikes, treadmills as demand wanes. And it's interesting. For most financial planning topics, OG, we can safely record on a Thursday for Monday. Nope, we had to go back to the drawing board and do this one again because this is moving fast. Do over. By the time this airs, things might have even changed more. So uh, what's up with Peloton? Uh, they're basically giving them away for free. I saw a tweet the other day that said uh, that said that they're going to have to pull a Joseph A. Bank and do a six-for-one special to get rid of the inventory. <laughs> Ouch. Peloton plans to pause bike production for two months from February to March. The documents show it already halted production of its more expensive bike plus in December and will do so until June. It won't manufacture its tread treadmill machine. What a great name. Tread tread. What are we going to call it? Um, it's a treadmill. So we'll call it uh, it's like the boat in Scotland. That's Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> right, Love it. Right. Love it. Right. Right. We're not going with Earl's suggestion to call it mill. I think Julie's got it right. We'll call it tread. Uh, it's tread treadmill machine for six weeks beginning next month. And it doesn't anticipate producing any tread plus machines in fiscal 2022. You know that you probably don't have a hit product when you're like, nope, we're good for the entire year. Don't got to make any more of those. Well, if you look at the uh, inventories on their balance sheet, basically since 2020, since COVID, have gone from worth about 200 million to the last quarter of 2021 so uh, September of 2021 to 1.2 billion inventories. Hmm. So, yeah. Is this just COVID? I mean, is this just the fact that the stocks that surged on COVID news went down because also as we're recording this on Friday, we've got, uh, we got some not so fun happening over at Netflix as well. OG. Well, I mean, I, I certainly don't know, but I think the difference between those two is that they're not anywhere near market saturation on Peloton. It's just different. You know, we were, I was reading in the morning brew this morning about, uh, the demand waning for people who, you know, don't want to be sweaty in their own living rooms, but want to be sweaty next to a random dad on an elliptical now, <laughs> you know, so they'd yeah. rather go to the gym than, than, than stay at home. And I think that has more to do with the, you know, the social aspect of it than, than actually getting a workout. I mean, you can get, you can work out using a pair of rubber bands if you want. I mean, you don't, you don't need tools. You can do like my kids ask me, how do I get stronger? I'm like, do push ups until your arms fall off. Yeah. But like, how do I really do it? It's like, you can be very strong if all you did was push-ups and sit-ups and squats. Like, you don't need weight. You've got enough body weight to deal with it. So Some of us more than others. Yeah, well, yes, that is very true for you. But how many how many people have you talked to that say, I can't wait to get back out on a plane? You know, I, gotta, I wanna go sit in a hotel and... Bad example. Go travel. and You know what I mean? Like, people wanna do that stuff, so... Yeah, go back out to the gym, right? Yeah. I mean, when we talk to about Peloton, we talk about Netflix. I know that some people aren't big fans of the movie theater. I think, Doug, that includes you. Yeah. Not a big fan of going to the movie theater, but for me, I'd much rather see a film at, at a movie that, theater. Yeah, that had nothing to do with COVID. It just wasn't a need for me. There are a few. 
films where you feel like you got to see that on the big screen, but yeah, just don't care. No, I, I was actually referring to the fact that there's a lot of people like me that want to go back to the theater more often. I clearly went to the movie theater much less the last two years than I went yeah. before. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, and you know, yeah. that was COVID related. You know, the other, the other tweet that I saw that I thought was really funny about Peloton, it says, turns out it's just a really crappy exercise bike attached to an iPad. Good thing they're not, they're, there's not a car manufacturer doing the same thing. <laughs> wow. That's a, wow. That's a bitter individual. Ooh. I don't know. Y- you own a Peloton and it's, a, it's actually a nice piece of equipment, isn't it? I don't know the first darn thing about quality of equipment, but I can tell you that uh, we have used ours quite a bit over a five-year period and um, haven't had a single issue with it. So so let's turn this into a financial planning discussion because we can go on all day about how- Sell your Peloton stock short. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about Peloton, about what happened with that company, but I think there's an analogy here. I think a lot of times- you look at uh, pro football players as an example. They know, oh, gee, that they're having a season, right? That they are making tons of money. And you see some pro football players, they end their career and they go broke very quickly afterward. I feel like Peloton had a similar season, the COVID season, where they had this big old rush. And man, the hot second things are changing for Peloton, they fiscally don't seem to be ready to transition to a more normal existence? Well, I mean, or are they? Maybe, is this not them transitioning to a normal existence? You know? I mean, maybe they overshot the I don't landing. think it would be so. So I've got two headlines in front of me. Let me tell you why I don't think this is, quote, transitioning to a normal existence. One headline says that the CEO on Wednesday denied that they would be halting production of any anything. Then I have another one on Friday saying they're halting production of everything. (laughs) I don't think that's what you do when you're making a planned, normal transition. You and I talked about not reacting to things, about being in a position where you have an investment policy statement. You make moves at these regular intervals so you're not emotional. Tell me when you go to the press on Wednesday and you say one thing, and then on Friday, you do the exact thing you said you weren't going to do. they hired a McKinsey consultant, so... The McKinsey guy said he had to do this. That's what we're going to blame it on the McKinsey That's guy. That's why they yeah, do this. Yeah, hey, if it were me, I wouldn't have halted anything. But uh, the McKinsey dude. That's what consultants are for. That's right. Take all the blame. Tell you what you already knew, but yeah, take the blame. Yep. Take the blame. Well, I don't see anybody blaming McKinsey in the news today. Not in the news, mostly no, saying, but the, the board and the <laughs> investors can. <that, laughs> wasn't me. Right. Hey, wasn't me. But I think there is a lesson here to plan for when the season's over. Well, when you look at your balance sheet, you can see the trends emerging. And maybe along the way, you decide to make some changes to stay on course as opposed to waiting until you have to take the nuclear option. You know, it's like if you're looking at your cash flow and every single month you're taking a little extra out of your savings account and it's kind of sort of coming down a little bit and you decide, eh, I'm not going to even pay attention to that. Eventually, you've got to pay attention to it. And eventually you pay attention to it in a really aggressive manner, like going, and we've got to, you know, cut everything or whatever it is, as opposed to making a small change a year ago. And maybe if they would have made a small change a year ago, then it wouldn't be as catastrophic today. So I have uh, family members, you know, to make this really personal, I think for a lot of families that the last couple of years have been talking to when one of their kids had a birthday, they were taking the family for a week to Disney. And my birthday was a couple weeks ago. Could I get a trip to Disney? You can. Yeah. Probably not with this relative of mine, but yes. Yeah, go do it. But they've been planning it for a long time. And yet from afar, it has appeared that they've continued to make purchases that haven't aligned with their values, you know, and not to be all Judge McJudgerson. I, I suppose I am a little bit when I say that from afar, I'm watching how they spend money. It just doesn't seem to add up. Uh, the things that they're spending money on and some questionable purchases. And they had this big trip that they've talked about forever. And then we're talking to them last week. And instead they're going to a uh, low cost, not phenomenal resort community for three days for a long three day weekend instead of this huge week long Disney trip. But it's very sudden. The change was very sudden going, Whoa, Hey man, we can't do any of this stuff we've been talking about for a couple of years. And I think it's easy to look at the balance sheet and go, you know what, but hey, if we're, if we're taking the family to Disney, we need 14 bags of money. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So we'd better start saving to uh, put some money at the feet of the mouse. 
but on the other side, you can also kind of look at yourself, OG. I mean, you know, it's keeping it personal. I'm 53. If I don't think that things aren't going to change for me, like the way I feel about life and the way I feel about what I'm doing, the way I feel about my work habits, whatever, isn't going to want to change in the next 15 years. I'm crazy. You need to, at some point, start planning for, yeah. hey, I'm not going to feel, but you know, somebody who's 25 that says, I know that I want to retire by the time I'm 40 and I'm comfortable living in a tent. You and I have talked about that. When you get to 40, you might not feel that way. If you're at Peloton and you haven't been thinking, maybe this COVID thing's going to end someday and we need a, some strategery to get out of this. I don't know what to say about any of that, but yep, I agree. How's that? I, I don't know. From, 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 yeah, correct. From afar, it just doesn't look like there's a lot of planning going on. It's just a lot of sweat. That's what they really focus on. Not, not so much planning, just pedal faster. That's probably, <laughs> honestly, that's probably the, you know, the culture, I bet, is very much like that. They got that, hey, we're spending money hand over fist and nobody's buying our stuff. What do we do? Hey, let's have Jane come in. Come on, everybody. Exactly. All right. <laughs> we're going to get this. We're going to get this Peloton board meeting moving. So let's say this is you and your family, OG. Let's say that it's time to make some deep cuts. You haven't cut, and now you need to you need to find some money quick. Where are your biggest opportunities? Well, the biggest expenses are housing and food and, and automobile, you know, transportation, right? So that's likely to be a, kind of the biggest pieces, but it's also the hardest to move immediately because you can't just sell your house tomorrow. I think that the first thing that you have to do is be realistic and go through your checking account, go through your credit card statement and find out what the heck you really spend money on, you know, get an accurate representation of really where your money's going. You know, a couple of months ago, I said that we were doing our kind of annual cash flow thing and that we had 450 Amazon purchases spread across 365 days of 2021. You know, I mean, it's real. You, I, it, I, I would not have guessed that if you would have said you had Amazon come to your house at least once a day, the entire year, I would say no, no, maybe every other day. Nope. Every day and sometimes twice. Every day. And, you know, it's just the facts of the case. Now, I know people are like, well, but Amazon bills, down. I get that. But you can do the same thing with going out to eat. DoorDash on our Amex card is ridiculous, you know? And until you see it, you can't make a change until you get clear about what the reality is. So so the first thing that you have to do, I think, is get a sense of where all the bodies are buried. And then you can decide which ones, you know, you want to make some, make some changes with. I was wondering where that analogy was going to finish know where the bodies are buried and then decide which ones you're going to dig back up. Dig back up. I don't, I don't know. Don't know where that goes. Yeah. I think that's uh and this is why also I like the, I like the weekly meeting OG, yeah. especially during those times of uh, where the belt's got to be tight. Cause man, there's got to be a lot of communication going on during those times. Hey, time for our TikTok minute. This is where we find a TikTok creator. In this case, it's an Instagram real creator who is doing something either brilliant or eye-rolly, to coin a term. Uh, which one's it going to be today? Uh, Roly-poly, eye-rolly. Oh, let's see. This is uh, Big Torn, who actually uh, says for about two seconds it was making sense. So apparently Big Torn here is eye-rolling too. Let's see what he's eye-rolling on. If you get a loan from a bank, bro, they're going to take you about 20, 30 years to pay back. But if you rob the bank, you only get like 10 years. Come on, man. Follow me for more financial advice. <laughs> follow me for more financial advice. Doug, that sounds like financial advice from you, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, they let you keep the money you take from the bank, right? So you're good. <laughs> right. And you get free housing well, and food for 10 years. You're net way up. You're net positive through the roof. We talked about cutting those expenses. Right. You know, you would definitely cut some expenses if you were incarcerated. Yeah. I mean, you get instant friends. You get an instant click to hang with. That sounds like a great plan. <laughs> that's, 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 all, that's all we need. Where are you going? Doug goes marching up the stairs. Okay. Uh, which is funny because we're on to his segment. Hey, we've got uh, Tara McKenna coming down to the basement today. She runs a website called the Zero Waste Collective. And her goal is to be less trashy. Let's see if we can clean up the trash in our life. She's not only a fantastic blogger, but has a book called Don't Be Trashy which is a simple 12-step guide. And man, flipping through this, there are so many ideas of easy things that you can do to clean up your life. And when you have less trash sitting around, 
you can be more focused on stacking Benjamin. So Tara coming down it, it, here. He comes Wait, where the hell did you go? Like weird is two minutes away. Where the hell did you go? Well, I went to go rob a bank. Duh. <laughs> I told you where I was going. <laughs> Trying to find the ski mask. Got to get the ski mask before you do the trivia. Step one, step two. Oh man, you got, you got trivia to do. Tara's waiting upstairs. I do. Yes. All right. Fine. Yeah. Sorry. You didn't hear the uh, open there, but um, Hey, let's roll it. There's stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I can't wait to talk trash with Tara McKenna. Nothing better to get a week started than talking about all the f***ing bullshit happening here in the basement. You're damn right I'm going to air this dirty laundry, people. I mean, OG's consistently leaving the f***ing water running in the shower for a f***ing hour so that nobody gets any water. I'm always so cold, my nipples are completely standing at attention. I'm talking total f***ing diamond cutters here, guys. What? It's what? Oh, we're not trash talking? I thought Tara's whole thing was... <laughs> oh, my bad. Uh, <clears throat> okay, it's not what went wrong. It's how you rebound. All right, okay. Here we go. Hey, so let's get you some trash-themed trivia, shall we? When it comes to trash, what country produces the most trash per person in the whole wide world? I'll be back with the answer right after I wash my own mouth out with soap. I mean, that got really trashy. Sorry, people. My bad. Man, man yeah, it did. That's what happens, OG, when Doug misses the uh, intro to the guest. Yeah. Hey, speaking of being present, if you like Peloton had a holiday season where maybe she got a little aggressive on the production line. If you know what I mean, producing a lot of not just trash, but a lot of expenses on the credit card. And it's time to get your house in order before January ends, or at least here in the first quarter. Heck let's even say OG in 2022 that you're going to get your act in order. Navy Federal Credit Union can help you take control of your finances after the holidays. Uh, there are lots of different things that you can do. They offer digital tools and educational resources to help guide your decisions. Lots of guides to help you make better money decisions at Navy Federal. Also, you can get their low intro APR on their platinum credit card. Now, obviously, another credit card in your wallet doesn't help, but if yours is a high interest rate card, you can lower your interest rate by transferring the balance there so you're paying less interest to the man while you're cleaning up your debt. It's their lowest rate card. Great tool to help you pay down debt. They even have multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. You can buy fractional shares if you're going to invest through them, and you can automate your savings and put your money to work for you even as you sleep. So learn more at NavyFederal.org. Message and data rates may apply. That's NavyFederal.org. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Bonjour. Welcome to French Made Easy with me, your host, Mathilde. Today, I'm joined by certified financial planner Devin Carroll, and together we will share a popular and simple French phrase so you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Sure. Today's phrase is valuable when you see a woman named Sally. Say this. Sally, can I store my gold in your doomsday bunker? In French, you would say this popular phrase just like this. Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti fin du monde? Once again. Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti fin du monde? Now, let's hear certified financial planner Devin Carroll try it. Ready, Devin? Okay, yes. Sally, est-ce que de ranger mon dans ton bunker en ta fin du monde? Oh yeah, I know that for sure. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike? You two can speak French easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Au revoir. Hey there, stackers. I'm basement garbage taker-outer and notable recycling expert Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I think I owe Tara McKenna a big apology. I mean, with all the 
trash out there. Why wouldn't we talk about trash instead of sitting around trash talking? And boy, do we have some cleanup to do, people. Um, remember our trivia question? Just in case you dozed off, here it is again. Which country produces the most trash per person on Earth? Get this statistic. Weighing in at an amazing 1,600 pounds of trash per person per year, it's the USA. And on that note, let's get less trashy with Joe and Tara McKenna. And here she is, the queen of all things not trashy, Tara McKenna's here. How are you? I'm good, Joe. How are you? Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so happy that you're here. And it doesn't surprise me that you travel light, by the way. That is not a shock. Like, you don't come with 16 suitcases and uh, <laughs> all kinds of 85 changes of clothes and all that stuff. Just a backpack and a whole bunch of reusables. By the way, I have a friend who loves traveling as light as he can. And by the way, this has nothing to do with just being trashy. He just enjoys the challenge of traveling with less. And we'll talk about the challenge of even living with less, right? But are you that type of traveler now? You found the perfect like polyester blend hiking pants and the shirt that you can rewear 14 times? Um, is it embarrassing to say no, that I don't travel as light as I should? My husband makes fun of me. I'm like the minimalist who doesn't pack light because I need to be ready for anything and everything in the moment. But the thing is, with this lifestyle, I have been converting to more of like finding items that I can use for multiple different things. So uh, it's getting lighter, Joe. It's getting lighter. Yeah, but still, <laughs> I love that answer because of the fact, and you make this clear in your book. When you talk about zero waste, like zero waste in your life is a goal, but, but let's be clear, there are steps along the way and it's okay to get 30% there, 50% there, 70% there. This is a journey. It a hundred percent is a journey. And I'll tell you when I started the journey, I went all in, like I was really hardcore at the start and I got to a point where my husband was hiding chips on me. Like he, he would put them in cupboards that don't store food and then Behind the passenger seat of his car, I would find packages of cookies. Seriously, I think it went too far. We we reached a tipping point where zero waste was too zero waste for us, even though it's it's technically impossible to be zero waste in our society. But for me, I was like, all oh, the reusables, you know, go to the store with our own containers and, and no packaging comes home. And, and I think that became too much for my husband who needed cookies and chips. And, and so I've come to a place now where I'm like, okay, we don't have to be that hardcore. But getting there by itself is a journey. And this is what attracted me to your project, the blog, and to your book is the fact that you never in any of your writing come across as this person who has always been this hardcore. I wear the same clothing every day and I just eat red beans and that's it. And I have <laughs> one package for my stuff. Like you're a regular person. Let's talk about the beginning of this journey because you cover this in the preface of your book. And I guess it's yes. a wonderful place to start. So you were going to a wedding. You were going to your dad's wedding. Tell us that story. Yes. Yeah. So my dad lives in Indonesia and uh, he got married in Jakarta, Indonesia. We were meeting his new family and we decided that we would all go to Bali as a family. Oh, that would so suck. We did. That'd be horrible. It was awful though, <laughs> especially coming from a place that's a bit colder in terms of climate. Anyways, so we went to Bali and I envisioned it to be a pristine destination. And don't get me wrong. It is phenomenally beautiful. Have you ever been? I haven't. You know, we were going to go and then this weird thing happened in 2020. Like, we, oh no, we had a place rented for a month, Tara. It was, I was so excited to go. Yeah. And then uh, this little thing this little pandemic happened. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, it should still be on your list. <laughs> That's okay. Put salt in the wound. Tell me how awesome it was. It's so amazing. Okay. So the palm trees and the sand and the sun, and it was so beautiful. But then, you know, as soon as I went into the water with my snorkel and mask, I just saw so much trash intermingling with the fish and the coral. And as someone who's like a nature enthusiast, I was absolutely devastated. It made me really, really sad. And, you know, you start to feel really small in that moment. Like you're just surrounded by garbage, essentially. And you're like, well, what can I do? And it's not like in that moment, I made the direct connection between my lifestyle and the trash I was seeing. I'm like, this was somebody else's problem in, in that moment in my mind, right? Not like the Snickers bar I ate last week or whatever, you know, it, it just didn't connect to me my 
lifestyle. But eventually it came, you know, to me a few years later when I started to discover this like lifestyle of zero waste living. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. Why didn't I even think about this? You know, we live in a very convenient space society where, you know, we eat and and buy things and, and toss so much on a regular basis. So that connection is now really clear. But there's, there's two steps along that journey that I don't want to leave out because I think these are fantastic steps. The number one was you said earlier that you went all in, you went all in that week. It sounds like, like you became that annoying family member that that's all you <laughs> wanted to talk about the night, the whole time you're with your family, like this waste thing sucks. Like anybody see this waste stuff? Like we shouldn't be this person. You became that person for a little while. I definitely was that person. And, and I'm sure they wanted to turn the off button. On, right. you know, like, can we shut her off? Like stop being Debbie Downer on our vacation, which is true. Like I definitely enjoyed our vacation, but you know, I came home and couldn't help but think about that issue. And it just really has stayed with me ever since. Well, and the other thing that I don't want to let go of, because when it comes to life changes and life direction changes, it always seems like those happen around big events in our life. And these big events hit us all different ways. Some people curl up in a ball and stop doing anything. Some people become a missionary. Some people, you know, just all over the place. You get this call. It sounds like it was in, in the middle of the night in Canada and a friend of yours was trying to get a hold of you. Yeah, this is a hard one for me to go through and re revisit this conversation. But yes, I got extremely bad news when we were on that trip to Bali because my best friend, well, my we were a little trio, actually, there's three of us. So my one best friend was trying to get a hold of me and my husband and I, we, you know, had finished hanging out with my family and we were going to do our own trip. We had trips around other islands and then we were going to go to Thailand and a, a whole bunch of other places. But in the middle of the night here and, you know, evening in Indonesia, I get this phone call. I'm like, why are people trying to get a hold of me? I'm on vacation. I, I don't want to, you know, be on my phone or whatever. My friend says to me, she's like, you need to sit down. You need to sit down for this. And I was like, oh, that can't be good. Something must be going on in her family or something. And uh, our other best friend had passed away tragically in, in a, a car a car accident. So um, it was a very, very hard time in my life. And, uh, you know, we came home immediately. Like as soon as, you know, we were about to go on the rest of our trip, we ended up taking a flight home. So that, you know, it, it took a long time for me to really get out of a place of grief. But when I did, it gave me an extra motivation to be like, okay, well, I'm here, you know, I'm here and I would like to make a difference. So what can I do? And it made the direct connection back to Bali to that moment I had seeing all that trash. I'm like, you know what, I want to make the world a better place. How can I do that? And so the zero waste lifestyle, the experience that I had all kind of came together and I decided to create a blog and I was working full time at the time. I don't anymore. I, I'm in my business full time now, but, um, I started a blog and it grew from there. So I really love the opportunity to share this message with other people that we can live lighter on this planet and, and live better, but in a way that isn't burdensome. Like it was a bit of a burden when I started because obviously my husband was hiding chips on me and it doesn't have to be that way. So you start with the blog and I kind of feel like as I'm reading your words that this is more, I mean, obviously it's, it's very personal and the blog might've been a way, and I don't want to put words into your mouth of kind of holding yourself accountable to this new lifestyle. And you make this statement that I really like, you talk about the role of government here and that certainly governments can do more. And there are laws that we can pass. And you talk about Greta Thunberg and others, but you have a statement about government involvement. Like, have you seen how long it takes just to get your license plates done? <laughs> yeah. Like why wait for a government? Like you're not going to wait for a government. You're going to go do things yourself. Yes. And I, I really want to reiterate, we cannot let governments off the hook. Big corporations and governments, those, you know, entities have a huge responsibility and they can impact huge change. That doesn't mean that we get to sit around doing nothing. In my opinion, I think we have the opportunity to take ownership over our own lives and to make a difference in our life, you know, within our families, our communities and amongst our coworkers and not in a way that's like the plastic police like I was when I first started yeah. this journey. You know, I think I was so keen on it and I, I was probably a little too obsessed with it, but I think that's the journey that I needed to take at that time. 
but we can take ownership of our lives. And, and what I like about the zero waste lifestyle movement is it gives you the chance to kind of assess your life. You're like, what am I consuming? And actually, I do talk about doing a trash audit. It might not be everybody's cup of tea to examine their trash for like a month, but it's a really great way to learn what type of waste you're consuming, right? What what are you buying or, you know, consuming? And what are you throwing out? And, you know, North Americans are sending about, you know, four and a half pounds of trash to the landfills like per day. And, you know, North Americans are, are huge consumers in that way. Well, I don't know if you heard when you were upstairs, but Doug's trivia question today leading into this, the average American, 1,600 pounds of trash a year, like the U.S. leads leads the world in trash per person, not in trash. I mean, it's a huge country in trash per person, which means all of us are, are a piece of it. But I want to get, and I want to get back to that trash audit because I want to give people at the end of today some tips and things that they can do to start off on this journey themselves. But I want to talk a little bit about the stakes in this journey because you found so many things changed for you. And I just want to go over these just briefly. Tell me how these changed for you. You said you were eating healthier. How does being less trashy help you eat healthier? Well, uh, a lot of food that is less packaged tends to be less processed as well. So a lot of packaged foods you'll find, you know, you can't pronounce some of the ingredients and, and there's probably a reason for that. Who knows who, what factory that was made in, right? So when you're eating a banana, what's in a banana? It's a banana. So <laughs> 100% banana. <laughs> Definitely advertisement, 100% banana. <laughs> so, you know, when I started to reduce the amount of packaging that came home with me, I was eating far better because a lot of it was whole foods. So that's why I was eating healthier, just because it was far less packaged. So your issue with your husband and, and cookies was not really the cookie. It was the packaging around the cookie. Yes. Like, <laughs> you know, Chips Ahoy come in that plastic insert, right? That's just going to yes. go in a landfill somewhere. I got it. I'm like, how, does, well, how do cookies, man, that's, that is hard. Next. No, he's allowed cookies. I never said he couldn't have cookies. In fact, <laughs> I didn't even tell him he couldn't buy packaged cookies. I was not, I was not the plastic police. I promise. <laughs> not the, yeah. Uh, the next few, I think go together, meeting new people, making new friends, getting involved in my community. Tell me about that. Yeah. So when I first started, I was going to a lot of events. Obviously the last couple of years have changed that a little bit, but this was a number of years ago that this started. So I was going to conferences, networking events, meeting people through Instagram and other social media and meeting them in real life because we had a lot in common. And so my network grew and it was really, really cool. And I'm still in touch with and friends with a lot of those people today. And, and I look forward to when a lot of those events can come back and, and, you know, I was actually talking to one of my friends online last night and being like, I really miss our conferences. And plus, also, you can get involved with your municipal government if you want to. So I do sit on a liaison committee with our waste management facility in the city what, that I live in. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get involved and meet new people. I find that when you get involved with like minded people, I'm thinking about I went to a camp this year. I spoke at a camp called Camp Fi which many of our listeners will know, which is, which is camp financial independence. These people go camping and they talk about becoming financially independent. And it sounds like the most boring thing on earth to a non-money geek, but it is so fun because you're not really talking about money. You're talking about values. And I imagine yes. in the zero waste community, it's the same thing. You talk about these shared values that you have. A hundred percent. And you know, this is really relatable because with the low waste or zero waste lifestyle, you actually save a lot of money unless you're going to buy a bunch of new sustainable stuff, which, you know, sure, if you want to go for it, but otherwise you would be saving a lot of money because you're technically consuming less than you would otherwise, because we live in a very consumer driven culture. I want to dive into that, uh, the consumer driven culture, because you, you write about where this all began, about how we got here. Take us back a little bit through history. How do we get to the point where we, I open up a package from Amazon, I grab the stuff inside of it, I chuck this huge amount of packaging that it came in and it goes to a landfill. How do we get here? Wow, yeah. So in a nutshell, <laughs> the 1900s were really a game changer. You know, we're coming out of this era of like industrialization and then the shift towards, you know, our technological society, right? So now we're online, we have the internet, we came out of industrialization. So we were able to mass produce and ship products so quickly, right? You know, we have goods going across the world. You know, we order something online, we get it tomorrow. It, it's, completely different than it was 100 years ago. But not only that, we were sold a lifestyle of consumption. So not only was it all of these things happening, 
marketing really picked up in the you know mid 1900s as well and with that we were sold like this idea that we needed to buy an amazing lifestyle where it's not about you know reusing what we inherited from our grandparents it's like well we can go buy something brand new for 100 bucks 50 bucks 10 bucks and and we don't need to inherit that because we can get something brand new instead and and because we're on this like hedonic treadmill of like i want this next best thing and i can get it tomorrow and i can buy it with my credit card we can have all of the stuff we ever wanted and and have a lot of debt with it too. (laughs) Yeah, right. It is so funny how this cleans up the budget, cleans up the debt and cleans up your house at the same time. You talk about how in your house, something that was, I don't know, it sounded like it might've been surprising at first, like how much clearer your mind was just because you didn't have all this clutter laying around. Exactly. So decluttering was a bit of the a part of the process for me. And it gave me a chance to sell items that were sitting around collecting dust that I didn't personally, you know, use anymore. But the nice thing is, if I sell it online, someone else can buy it and enjoy it. So one thing that eventually started collecting dust were my rollerblades, and I enjoyed my rollerblades for so long. But then one day I stopped using them and I did other activities and then they just sat in my closet. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this where something they stop using just sits in a closet or in a cupboard or on the floor. I don't know. It just sits there and doesn't do anything. So this is a good opportunity to take a new lens at your home and be like, do I need all of this stuff? And then on top of that, when you are decluttering to analyze your consumption patterns. Like that sounds really boring. How can I say that in a more exciting way? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, that sounds so boring, but you know what I mean? Like, yes. you know, if you have a, a doll collection, it's like, do you need to keep collecting dolls? Cause you're spending a lot of money on it and it's taking up space in your home. You're essentially paying rent for these dolls or, or whatever it is you collect. We had a department 56 collection, which I don't know if you're familiar with those, these little ceramic houses and stuff. And we had so many of them every holiday season, half of them would still stay in the closet and we ended up getting rid of all of them. And well, I miss it a little bit. I I realized I can go to a store and I can see the display without having to buy it and have it in my own house. And it actually is kind of more fun to see it once in a while than have it sitting in my closet and I've got to take it out, set it up and, and make it more pretty. Decluttering is a big part of your first chapter, even though you don't start there and your second chapter since you went there already, let's dive into decluttering. Are there rooms that I should start with decluttering? Like you, you talk about having a storage locker and a lot of people do. I mean, tons of people, these storage facilities, there's a new one going up here in Texarkana right now. So more and more people have so much stuff, Tara, that they're throwing it in this storage place where they forget about it for years. Do we clean out the storage locker first? Do we start with the attic or do we start with the things that we see? Where do we begin? You know, my first thought about when you say that is that I should really own a storage company because they must be making so much money for all of our clutter. You know what I mean? That business is absolutely booming. So where to start? It depends on your personal preferences and what you tend to collect. For me, I started with my closet because when my husband and I got married, we, you know, had a century home and it had the tiniest closet. So I started with my closet because when I emptied my storage locker that I had, I had nowhere to put all of my clothes. So I had no choice but either to have a mountain of clothes on my bed, you know, in addition to in my closet and in my drawers. Like, I I don't even know how I accumulated so many clothes. You know, I was obviously trying to keep up with the Joneses. So I decided that I would declutter. And that's where I started. And, And it's finding the things in your home that drive you a little crazy or or maybe like, you know, stress you out, or maybe you're stumbling over things. I would start there. When it comes to clothes and closets, do you do the Marie Kondo thing? The, if it sparks joy, keep it. If it doesn't spark joy, (laughs) get rid of it. Or does it matter? Um, The way I look at it is own things that reflect your current season of life. So what does that mean? It means, you know, I held on to a pair of shorts that didn't fit for like five years. So I eventually was like, I need to get rid of these shorts because every time I look at these shorts, I'm reminded that I need to lose five pounds. It didn't reflect my current season of of life. I wasn't taking that five pound loss too seriously. So I got rid of the shorts. So that's the way I recommend it. Think about what you do right now. And if, for example, the rollerblades was just not, they were not my season of life anymore. I was no longer a rollerblader. That's not how I wanted to spend my time. So it was time to declutter the item. So 
when you go through your closet of clothes, you know, this is a really tough time because we're going through this pandemic. Are we allowed yeah. to say that on this show? <laughs> talk about the pandemic? That we're going through the pandemic? I, I, <laughs> hey, like, should we say hashtag spoiler first? <laughs> Most people are, you know, probably wearing comfier clothes than usual. So it's a very comfy season of life. And yes. that certainly reflects my lifestyle right now. I don't really need blazers, but I really need some yoga pants. So anyways, the point is, look at your items and think, is this reflecting what makes sense for me right now? You talk about how most of us, when we were younger, we learned the three R's and you say it's yes. time to relearn the three R's. Yes, a hundred percent. So reduce, reuse, recycle. Did you grow up with that too then? Absolutely. And you know, what's funny if, if, if we're going to focus on one of these with a little bit of time we have left, I want to go into reuse because you make this great list of things that we can reuse that just, I think we need to be reminded of this one thing because you point out a few obvious wins like water bottles, coffee cups, straws. Those are easy wins. Cheryl, my spouse, carries a reusable straw everywhere she goes. And what's funny is you never realize how many times people offer you a straw. Like we, oh, get, yeah. we get offered straws everywhere and they're always surprised when she's like, no, I brought my own. That's great. That's wonderful that she does that. That's just one little thing, but still. It makes a difference. And and I do think, and I call it a zero waste kit. So basically the things that you're going to use throughout your day, whether it's a reusable bag or, you know, one big culprit is, you know, when you're grocery shopping and you're going through the produce section, it's really easy to get a lot of those plastic disposable produce bags. Yes. So if you bring the reusable version, then you don't even have to bring it all of that trash on that you'll eventually just throw out anyway. So I like keeping those in my zero waste kit too. But also utensils, you know, it's surprising how many times you'll be out and you'll be like, oh, I really need a bite to eat. And, you you know, if you keep an extra set of utensils with you in your bag, it doesn't even have to take up a lot of space. So what about you talk about napkins, handkerchiefs, uh, those things? Yes. And actually, I'm embarrassed because I was getting a bit of a runny nose and I've like, got my hanky here. So. <laughs> there, there, um, there it is. So, yes, uh, we don't buy tissues anymore. We use hankies. <laughs> but you say to add on five more. Oh, and before I get to that, another piece of advice that I like that you have trade with other people. Like if you're done with those roller blades, maybe trade them for something that you will use with somebody else. Yes. You know, this is becoming a, mo a lot more popular, but have you heard of buy nothing? Groups? Yes. Yes. So there are so many ways and, and buy nothing group is a really great movement where you can swap with other people. So you can either swap with people that, you know, so you could like host an event where say you decluttered the clothes in your closet and you happen to be relatively the same size to your friends. You can have a party and just swap clothes and then decide, you know, what you want to do with the rest, whether you want to sell it or donate it. But buy nothing groups are a really great way to, you know, offload your stuff online, but also to find things that you need that you don't even have to spend money on, you know, if someone's getting rid of like, you know, an instant pot or something. And you're like, Oh, I really need an instant pot. And you go on your group and someone's like, Oh, I really want to get rid of my instant pot. And then there you go. You've got a free instant pot. It's really great. <laughs> That's fantastic. You add on five more to the three R's. You say there's five more that we need. Just give me one or two sentences on each of these. If you don't mind Tara rot. Yeah. Yeah. So actually I have to tell you, I have my notes here. Cause like, I am so bad. Cause like, I'll say the same thing twice. I'll be like, did I say reuse or, or repair anyway? So yes. um, in addition to reduce, reuse and recycle, we've got refuse, rot, repair, repurpose and rethink. I want to highlight rot really okay. quickly because that essentially means to compost, right? So a huge part of the waste that we create in our homes is organic waste. And when it goes to landfills, it creates a really toxic greenhouse gas called methane. So one way that we can significantly reduce our waste without doing too much, you know, to reduce it is simply to, to just compost. So whether or not your municipality has compost facilities. You can do this at home using things like worm bins. There's, there's so many different home like compost recycling systems. It's a simple way to reduce your waste, but I really like some of these other ones like repairing, you know, we we've become a culture where planned obsolescence is a thing. And, and essentially it became really popular in the 1900s to, to create stuff that wasn't built to last. So, you know, we, 
see that in so many things that break these days. Something like as simple as a toaster or any other kitchen appliance where you're like, oh, I only just bought that last year and it's already broken. So I really advocate for buying things that you know were built to last or have good warranties or that they're repairable. So you don't have to go out and buy another one next week because it wasn't built to last in the it's funny. Start. Yeah, it's funny. We had that with a can opener. We bought an electric can opener and it immediately just the engine was and you'd have oh, to yeah. keep resetting it, resetting it. You know what I did? I got rid of the electric can opener and went back to the hand crank because the right? hand crank, the hand crank I can use forever. That thing will never go bad. I think my exactly. Yeah. I think my parents maybe inherited their hand crank from my grandparents. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of just about going back to basics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where do I need the innovation and where, where don't I? Uh, this, by the way, is maybe a third of what's in the first chapter of your book. And what's cool is you kind of push people to go on a don't be trashy challenge with your book. Talk a little bit about the challenge because Cheryl and I, my spouse and I went for a walk this morning before we started our day. And we were talking about how we're going to do this challenge, Tara. I think this is going to be super fun. Yeah, absolutely. It just... It's fun. It's rewarding. You feel good. You say early in the book, you're like, I feel like a badass and you can too <laughs> when, you, when, you're <laughs> bringing your, when you're bringing your own straw places. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I laughed. But, but talk about the challenge. Okay. So my book, Don't Be Trashy, and I know this is also going on YouTube, right? So I'm, yes. this is the US cover actually. Yeah. And by um, the way, for those of you not on YouTube, just imagine a pretty good looking cover of a book. There you go. Oh, it's it's beautiful. The book is basically outlined in like 12 different chapters and each chapter focuses on a different element of ways to reduce your waste. So we've talked about a few of them already. So it's one thing to declutter, but you also need to consider what's coming into your life because if you declutter and then buy a bunch of whole new stuff, then you're just going to reclutter, still consume and still waste. And then we talk about other elements in this book, uh, ranging from like, you know, swaps in your bathroom, like how you can reduce waste. A lot of people really collect a lot of toiletries. I don't know if you've ever looked under your cupboard and been like, whoa, I'm going to close that cupboard. Yes. I, you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, your bathroom, your kitchen, I go through how to grocery shop with a new lens, um, but it's not about being perfect, of course. And then also detoxifying your whole home because indoor air pollution is a huge thing these days from the different products that we buy and chemicals that we're using in our home. So I really cover the gamut, but also um, I talk about things like how to just navigate this new world with your friends, your family, and then the world is also just trying to give you a bunch of stuff. So how can you refuse that stuff, but not in a rude way, right? Setting it up for conversations where like at Christmas time, for example, or whatever holiday you celebrate where there's gift giving involved, how can you set it up so you don't get a bunch of stuff that you don't want? Because that adds clutter, it creates waste, and it's kind of awkward because you're like, do I keep that? What do I do with that? Thank you. I don't know. Right. So I address all these things. And and it's a great way to start the year because it's, you know, you could take it month by month if you wanted to and address each topic on a month by month basis. That's what we thought. Four weeks is a good time to at least get ourselves acclimated to the topic on each chapter. And we've got enough time to go through it and maybe peel off a little bit at a time and make sure that we implement as much as we possibly can. Because it's not just about reading it, it's about doing it. And what's neat is I just love this idea of making our budget lighter, our minds clearer, and able to focus on the things that matter to us. That's fantastic. Tara, thanks a ton for coming and talking about not being trashy. Don't be trashy is available everywhere now, right? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> awesome. Well, congratulations on, on a great project. We'll link to the blog. We'll link to the book on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate it. It's been so much fun and I'm excited to read your book too. This is Scott from California. When I'm not hiking at national parks, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Tara for hanging out. Oh, gee. And I'm inspired. You know, one thing that I've always thought about doing that I haven't done is uh, composting. I think this uh, composting idea is uh, is just a great thing we can add to the repertoire. As much coffee as you go through. I know coffee is a big uh, composting thing, yeah. you know, waste that you can use. I got, and I got lots of apple cores on my MetPro diet now. I mean, I'm a two apple a day kind of dude. Time to be composting all that stuff. If one apple a day keeps a doctor away, what does two apples do? The dentist as well. Oh. No doctor, dentist for me. I decided yeah. I'm never going to the dentist again. No, just that's bad. You know, OG, you're right about the coffee and composting. I do that all the time. I've been doing it for years, and now I've got mocha-flavored carrots. 
I mean, you can really get creative with what you put in your soil. And it's like you're doing genetic engineering in your own backyard with the results. It's fantastic. It's like an espresso. It's like people do with wines, you know, but now you do it with carrots. Hmm. These carrots have sense of Dunkin' Donuts. Is that rose hips? Yeah. <laughs> The other thing that's amazing too for, for me is that you guys know that I sold just about everything that we owned when we were nomads a couple of years ago. And uh, it is amazing how quickly we have recluttered. <laughs> <laughs> Who saw that coming? <laughs> it is not good. And I love the fact that this is a process. You don't have to be perfect, people. That OG is a lot like financial planning, right? You do not have to be perfect. Just get off on the journey. Do it. Yep. Do something. The first step is the most important one. That's all you have to do. Hey, let's roll with Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put, Doug, what you value first. My arthritis medication. Man, that is, I know, helpful for you. It gives you more uh, fun time with your loved ones. Loved ones in time spent without suffering from arthritis. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. <laughs> like we tried to shoehorn that in. Yeah, it's such a stretch. I'm like, where is he going with this? <laughs> Pretty much going nowhere. <laughs> Head to benjamins.com slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. Pause this right now if you've got uh, people that need your help uh, and you have not done your life insurance duty, peeps. Their application is simple. It's online. OG and I uh, both remember the days when it would take 30, 40 minutes to go through the application, but this now just a few minutes, prices are affordable. All policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. So while they are a fintech company, you also get the backing of a company that's been there and knows what they're doing. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our friend VJ. Say hi, VJ. Hi, Joe and OG. Hope you had great holidays. My question is how to adjust the 4% rule after considering taxes. I live in a high cost of living area in New Jersey. If I assume that I need $100,000 per year in expenses, I'll need 2.5 million nest egg with the 4% rule without accounting for taxes. But if I'm taking that much distribution from my traditional 401k or IRA, I'll have to pay both the income tax and capital gains tax at the federal and state level. What's a reasonable number to assume for taxes? I know that the exact numbers will depend on so many personal factors, and it's not fair to expect that from two guys in the basement who know nothing about me, but I need to pick some number to set my end goal. Because if I assume 25% total tax for income and capital gains, uh, then that 2.5 million goal will now become about 3.35 million, which is a significant change, and I'll need to plan accordingly. Thank you for not teaching anything, Vijay. <laughs> Thanks. For the question, VJ, and I love the fact that VJ is handling our disclaimer for us. But hey, I know two guys in the basement don't know anything about me. But uh, taxes, OG, let's talk about uh, about tax treatment on that money because he's got a point there. If, if you're saving X amount of money and it's all in pre-tax cash, some of that has to go to the government. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing that we want to point out here is that at the end of the day, it, you don't know whether or not your tax plan that you're working on today is going to pay off in 25 years from now until 25 years from now. So we don't know what tax rates are going to be. We can guess, we can kind of look at the tea leaves and have an opinion about it, but but we don't know what this, what's really going to happen 20 or 30 years from now. So it makes good sense to have a little bit of kind of everything, a little bit of pre-tax money, a little bit of after-tax money like a Roth and, and, and a little bit of uh, brokerage account money, non-tax deferred money of any kind that gives you the flexibility. The good news is that when you take money out of your workplace plan, you don't pay taxes on the gains and on the income. You only pay income taxes. So you'll pay a tax on the entire distribution amount, but you won't pay a capital gains tax. That's just kind of baked in there. Frankly, you'd rather pay capital gains. It's generally less than ordinary income. But the good news is it's not both. Yeah. But you will have some state taxes and, and different states tax retirement planning uh, distributions differently. Some states exclude it altogether if it's from an IRA. Some states tax it fully. Some states have a, a larger credit, uh, so that'll be different everywhere. But but you do have to count that in your plan as you're thinking about you know if you're just using the four percent rule and saying well I need a hundred thousand, well really you need one hundred twenty if you're going to take money out from from a tax standpoint. So then yes, you would need more money than that. But I think you're also not counting Social Security perhaps or earned income over you know early parts of retirement or something like that. So. It's best to have money in all the different buckets because 
let's say that the tax bracket is at 70,000 and you need 100, well, maybe you take 70,000 out of your pre-tax account and 30,000 out of something else. And then that last 30,000 is taxed more favorably. So flexibility is really the most important. VJ, if you want another resource here, we had Ed Slot on at the end of the year, noted tax expert. And what I what I found funny, OG, was he was talking about the pre-tax stuff VJ mentions and said that a pre-tax retirement plan really is a joint account. Yeah. It, it is you and your Uncle Sam. It's not you and a loved one. It is Uncle you, Sugar. You and your uncle. And every time that you make money as uh, your Peloton stock hopefully rebounds, what you find is that uh, government's going to take part of that. So with a Roth, government's going to take none of it. That's right. It's right now. Right. <laughs> The, the, the way things are now. But 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 I kind of agree with David McKnight on that issue. And I know I've had conversations with lots of tax people on this, that the Roth IRA is so widely used, OG, for the government to change that rule where, you know what, Roth IRAs, that money gets taxed somehow would be a huge, huge reason not to vote for somebody. Yeah, that's going to be a third rail issue if and when it comes up. No, I mean, the I don't know. If I were doing it, the easiest way is just to get rid of it. You know, then it's gone. I yeah, mean, like grandfather it in and go, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, I still stand by what we've talked about over the over the last couple of years of if you want to fix the retirement planning issue, you have to uncap the savings opportunities and make a cap per person, regardless of where you're going to put the money. N- no caps on on all these different things and all these different income restrictions and and well, this plan you can put twelve thousand in, and this plan you can put six, and this plan you can put twenty thousand. Unless you're this age, then you can put this in. Unless you make this income, and then you can only do this. Just say everybody gets to put thirty grand away. I had a note from a listener a couple of weeks ago, and I apologize, but because I don't have your name in front of me, but was talking about, uh, you know, we got the HSA, we got all these different things. Why don't we just make one account? It's retirement and healthcare, and you dump money in it. Just one flipping account. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've got a workplace plan that's awesome and you like, then put all your money in that. If your workplace plan is crappy and full of high cost annuities, then you get to put your money elsewhere. Why should I be penalized? Because the plan that I have accessible to me isn't advantageous, right? Or I can't be, you know, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, it's like like some people need to have that money taken out of their paycheck, right? Like if if it comes out of the paycheck, they're going to put 20 grand away. They could put a hundred grand away if they put it comes out of their paycheck, but if they got to take it out of their bank account, it's not going to happen. Nothing. So happen. just say, okay, I can do whatever the number is, forty, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, if you add it up, if I've got, if I can do twenty in my four hundred and one k, my spouse can do twenty in hers, and we can do a seven thousand in HSA, and we can do twelve thousand in, in IRAs between the two of us. I mean, that's sixty some odd thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars. That's a big number. That's a big number. So why don't we just say it's seventy grand or fifty or some some number, and I get to put wherever the hell I want to put it. Pre-tax, post-tax, you know, Roth, traditional, who gives a crap? Thanks for the question, VJ. If you've got a question for us, head to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. That is, by the way, the 749th question we've answered on the show. And on that note, that's going to about do it for today. We've got a few things going on that I wanted to point out. We, in the last uh, couple days, figured out where we're going to be in Portland, Oregon for the tour. I'm going on tour. Uh, OG's going to go to many of the spots. My co-author, Emily Guy Birkin's going to come with me to probably about half of the spots. We'll also see Doug at some of them. Uh, Doc G, Paula Pant, uh, Len Penzo have also said they're going to join us, plus a bunch of the other voices that you hear here. So depending on the stop, but I'm headed to 40 cities. That starts March 1st for my new book, Stack, your super serious guide to modern money management. Thanks to everybody who's left us a uh, review of the book. And I'm, I'm loving just what people are saying. You know what I'm loving? I love the fact that people are reading it. What I love even more OG is that it's not what you know, it's what you do. And people that say that they've changed habits based on it already, or they're working on changing habits. I think it's a little early to say that I changed a habit based on a book that came out less than a month ago, but that they're working on it. That's, that's what I like to see. So, uh, starting March 1st, but anyway, we just found out that in Portland, Oregon and Raleigh, North Carolina, we now have homes Yesterday and today, we're working on Philadelphia and Baltimore, New York City, Boston. Right now, as soon as we get those settled, uh, we will work on the Midwest. We'll have more dates all the time. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stack. That's number one. Number two is we are running a contest 
You may know that if you refer people to our newsletter, the 201, where we take deep dives on these topics that we talk about during the show. Uh, so if you want more links, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. We're also giving away additional prizes for the next month. So no speaker. How about that one? We're going to do that to one lucky person. I think even better for money nerds, our friends at Tiller Money have agreed to give away five subscriptions to Tiller. So if you're somebody that loves your spreadsheet, but you want it automated, Tiller Money giving away five subscriptions. And then finally, we're also about fun and games here in the basement. We're going to give away five copies of our friend Shane's fantastic game, uh, Franklin's Fortunes. We're going to give away five of those as well. So 11 lucky winners, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 inside the newsletter. It tells you how to refer people. So if you're in on the 201 already, great time to turn people into new stackers. And last, if you need to be a better stacker than you are today, OG and his team are taking clients. So if you want to make better decisions, think bigger in 2022, stackingbenjamins.com slash OG leads you to their calendar. That is, I think, all the community announcements, OG. Anything else? Turn it back over to Doug. Let's go. Peeps, you ready to start your Monday? We'll see you next time. Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today, Joe. First, take some advice from Tara McKenna. Want a less trashy world? Start at home. There are lots of things you can do to be less wasteful. It's good for the world, but it's also good for your focus. Second, what is your cost structure? Maybe, like Peloton, it's time for an evaluation about what's really important. But the big lesson? While a little trash talk is fine, talking trash is a much better topic. But we just finished, and OG's already back in the shower using all the hot water. Give me a break, man. What the f***? Really? I see an involuntary ice bucket challenge in his very near future. Big thanks to Tara McKenna for joining us. You'll find her book, Don't Be Trashy, wherever books are sold. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I remember going to like the bar of my dad where they go hunting you know, or where they go after hunting and all the guys would be like, the bar oh. where your dad goes hunting was a different bar. <laughs> <So different>. <laughs> <laughs> Son, we're going hunting. Stay in the truck.
<laughs> Dad, we'll be out in seven or eight minutes. Just don't tell your mom. Wow. I don't think you want to use that. <laughs> I really don't. The downside of the MacBook, you know, I move my arms a little bit, you know, and you can see the... Uh, I do see that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not the MacBook. Isn't that the whatever stand it's on? Oh, it's, it's on my desk. So anytime I... Oh, what are, you, are you typing on the keyboard? What is it that is making you touch the MacBook? It's just me. Being me. Being me. Just gesticulating. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it sounds bad, doesn't it? Gesticulating? Sounds like something like you old men do. Gesticulate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't be trusted. This is... This is what happens when everybody's together. Are you guys in on this? I I don't do the Wordle. No? What's no. your best? I've never done it. Oh. Mine is zero. It's too bad. Zero, zero slash zero, zero. It's too bad. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like word games. I do crosswords every day, but I'm, I don't know. It's not. Have you tried it? No. And I'm, I'm actively resisting it because it's just too much of a f***ing fad. It 100% is, but it's fun. Yeah. Well, I do it with my kids. We uh, send out the results. My my best is I got it in two. I got it in. What was the last fad that went down in a hurry? The trivia Peloton. game. Oh, Peloton, right. Oh, Peloton. <laughs> no, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. No, there was a trivia game. Uh, Remember that one? And that one just went down in flames. Yeah, yeah, the one you do it at night. Yes. Right. I just started playing that thing when they went under. My mom won it twice. And how much money did she win? Because they always say that you win X amount of money and it ends up being like a dollar fifty. You win whatever the pot, you know, however many people it's yeah. the pot and it's just do yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's why I'm asking how much she won. Cause cause when you figure so out so the- little that she didn't qualify to make a withdrawal. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you had to get up to like twenty bucks to make a withdrawal. Yep. Still nothing usable. <laughs> We still have said nothing. Is that what we're doing here is we're just hoping something comes out that's usable? I, I keep thinking, hey, there's going to be a fantastic thing we can use for the after I show. I think if you could probably clip together all of the words that we've said from those three or four untouchable subjects and make one that is touchable. And just <laughs> try that, Steve. Let's see how good you are. Amazing, Steve Stewart. Steve, see if you can make something touchable. <laughs> He was the dude who posted candles aren't for, or they're for guys too, or something like that on Facebook the other night. I'm like, are you really? Oh, did he really? You sure, man? I mean, in the privacy of our own homes, who among us hasn't lit up a <laughs> cinnamon bun candle? But I'm not posting this shit on Facebook. <laughs> it's late at night. Doug tiptoes downstairs. Sometimes you just want to feel like you're wrapped in a warm blanket of cinnamon aroma. Hmm. See, I got my candle right there. Did I tell you about this candle? Please do. This is something I'm yeah. dying to hear about. I know. Let me tell you about this candle because this is a cool candle. So not only is this a balsam is fir. Is it the one that I got you last year? No, I, I love that candle though. That candle's gone. I burnt the hell out of that one. Oh my God. Uh, but this one is, after you burn the candle, it's a- Shot glass. It's a whiskey tumbler. No, you're right, Doug. <laughs> shot glass. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you guys play, but it's a little sipper. For me, that's a shot glass. <laughs> It's what we call a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the only non 18 ounce shot glass in my collection. Yeah. Let's record something. I've been recording this whole time. No, I mean like an episode. 